So back in, the topic is blood, and uh, I have with me Dr. Randall Schaefer and Dave Gravedahl. And uh, first of all, Dr. Schaefer, give us your, your backstory. So I am a retired Army trauma nurse. I spent 20 years in the U.S. Army. And, and during, thank you for your service. Thank you, and thank you for yours. Thank you very much. Um, and during that time, I unfortunately had to use blood quite a bit on my three deployments. And I took what I learned on those deployments and that military experience and brought it back when I retired to South Texas. And I helped set up the South Texas Regional Advisory Council, their pre-hospital blood program to the aircraft and the ground ambulances in the area. And I developed an onboarding process, which is hopefully a common sense approach for EMS to take as they try to start rolling out these programs. Because as uh, David knows, it, it's a largely unknown uh, task. There weren't any EMS agencies to do it. So they just need someone to help them through it. And then that's what I do. Actually, before we dig into this, Dave, would you like to introduce yourself? I know who you are. We know who you are. But... Uh... My name is Dave Grovedal. I am a 25-year paramedic, and I am the director of EMS for a hospital-based system in South Central North Carolina. So blood is being rolled out across the country, which is a good thing. Uh, this time last year, Dave, you gave me a very simple answer that uh, if it comes out of a person, we should just have it there to put it back in again. I think that was your answer. Absolutely. Uh, whole blood saves lives. Um, whole blood is saves no, lives. no doubt about that. And so um, it is probably the greatest improvement in trauma care in the civilian uh, world. And so we are trying to spread the message as far as we possibly can from coast to coast. Right now, you said... Uh, I, well, I think I said it's everywhere, but it's not everywhere yet, is it? It's not everywhere. Right now, we're currently tracking 150 ground EMS agencies that are utilizing it. And it is largely portioned off to certain parts of the U.S. There are some barriers to getting programs stood up, but we have had 150 successfully tackle it. Excellent. Are there any sort of blood deserts out there that we need to sort of encourage folks to do better? <laughs> Yes, unfortunately, we have a lot of blood deserts. So in states where uh, paramedic scope of practice does not allow them to initiate a blood transfusion, that is a barrier that needs to be overcome. But there are states that are successfully overcoming that barrier. And then others are facing challenges with getting blood sourced. So we have had some amazing blood centers step up, hospitals step up and support EMS. But unfortunately, that's not happening across the country. Right. So over to you, Dave. You've been running a program for, well, I guess over a year now because we spoke about it last year. And so how's it going and, and what, what results have you seen and outcomes? We've had some really fantastic support in North Carolina. North Carolina is a great state in the fact that we have both coast and mountains. We have both urban and super rural areas of the county, or excuse me, of the state. And we have blood all throughout. Uh, so we have urban centers like mine where we have blood going. We also have some rural areas um, where we know that trauma um, the mortality rates from trauma are very high in the, in the rural areas just because of access to hospitals and access to care. So we are getting blood into those areas where it is most critically needed. And so North Carolina has really made some great strides in a very short amount of time. So clearly this is going to end up in an appeal for everybody to give blood. Apart from us Brits, we can't give blood because apparently we may have some sort of uh, mad cow disease. That waiver has been in place now. It just got approved. Really? It is, oh, yes. I've been rejected by so I, many blood bank wagons, you wouldn't believe. I, well, I will clarify. For the U.S. forces in Germany, I will have to ah, double check we, and make sure that right. the Brits... No, I can't, I can't give blood here, which is... <laughs> it's uh, unfortunate. Mad cow disease. May have it, you never know. <laughs> anyway, so let's talk about... So I'm, I'm a logistics guy, right? And of course, the, the, the one thing that struck me straight away is if we all do blood, it's a good thing. But if we all do blood, it's a lot of blood we have to have prepared, delivered on the truck then a plan for its rotation or possibly its disposal, etc. So how do we, what, what do we need to think about when we're, when we're getting a program together? And where do we get it from? Absolutely, so the logistics are the challenge. The science is coming with the why, why yep. do we need to do this? As far as the how, different models are emerging across the country on how they best tackle it. And even here in North Carolina, we have along the Blue Ridge Mountains, uh, three different agencies that are doing pre-hospital blood and they are all doing it a little bit different to meet oh. their logistical needs. One gets supplied directly from a level four facility, so not even a large trauma center, yep. just a small facility that is willing to share their packed red blood cells right off their shelf at the agency. We've got blood centers 
that will ship blood into the area. And then we also have a level one trauma center that is uh, really the center of gravity for three other agencies by providing them a cooler every five days with blood products. So it goes out to the agencies. And then it's rotated back in. And then it's rotated back. Excellent, excellent. So, but Dave, I think you were, before we started recording here, there are other programs where we're asking our public safety brethren to actually be a part of the program in terms of donation. So in San Antonio, where Whole Blood uh, the program really, really got, got some feet underneath it, they developed a program called the Brotherhood. And so we know that low tide or O positive uh, whole blood, which is the blood that we use, um, is most prevalent in the adult male population. And so it got that title brotherhood. What we found when we started replicating those was as systems are using whole blood and they make appeals out into the community to say, the blood that you donate today may be on the ambulance you see at the intersection tomorrow right. and potentially will get used on a family member or a friend people have really stepped up to say, I'm gonna support my community. We see that a lot of times after disasters, people turn out in droves to support their community. Right. This is the same thing. And we have had great response um, when we tie the whole blood programs for the ground ambulances in the community back to the donation. And that has very much helped the blood centers um, get more of that blood. So, yeah. And I would also add that we are starting to show that if you get pre-hospital blood and you're coming in with an improved shock in Index, you know, improve vital signs that your consumption of products when you arrive to the hospital actually goes down. So we're getting to them earlier, faster, thereby decreasing the requirement they are, when they arrive to the hospital. That's excellent news. Now you're delivering a session here at the North Carolina EMS Expo. Uh, what's it on? So I had As the if we didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> Spoiler alert, it's about blood. Um, so I had the opportunity last year to come to North Carolina and meet agencies and learn what they're doing. And I wanted to tell their story. So I uh, worked with them and we submitted an abstract talking about how do they source their blood? What are their protocols? What are yep. the equipment that they're using? So I'm privileged that I get to facilitate a panel and we have Surrey County EMS, we have Caldwell County EMS, and we have Wilkes County EMS, along with uh, Christina Warren, who is a unicorn in the blood banking world. She said yes to EMS which is more important than saying yes to the dress, if you know that yep. show. She said, yes, we need to support EMS. And that's not happening everywhere um, in the US with the blood bankers. So we are all gonna sit down and just have a great discussion about how they're doing it and how they're successfully doing it. So I wouldn't be me if I didn't talk about politics and funding, right? And so of course, ambulance services reimbursed only for transporting a patient to hospital. Uh, this is happening in the field. Uh, we're not getting paid for it yet, are we, Dave? We are not. Uh, we have a national coalition that is working um, at the federal level in order to get uh, whole blood recognized as an ALS2 intervention. I think that's going to, when that happens, it's very much going to open the door um, because the reimbursement will, will match the costs. Um, and we also have a lot of coalitions from state to state. Florida has a coalition, Texas has a coalition, North Carolina has a coalition. Yeah. So we are all working at our statewide level. Um, in the hopes that we can put enough pressure at the federal level in order to get that change. And I think it's just a matter of time before the dominoes fall. Certainly, I was, I've certainly been up with NAMT and the AAA in the last few weeks, and obviously treatment in place and therefore ancillary treatments such as whole blood in the field we're up for discussion. You know, in certain states, California, I'm, 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 I live and work in California, of course, you know, 200 and something dollars for a Medi-Cal reimbursement doesn't cover, what is it, 800 bucks for the, for the blood? So we need, we, need, we need to work on this. And now, absolutely, uh, we know that whole blood saves lives. I mean, that is that is the basic premise, and and so EMS is well positioned to be part of that process. Like Randy said, when EMS gives whole blood, the the patient does better over time, as well as they wind up using less blood product, and so it it is it makes sense. And you know, that's step one is is we've got to make a strong, salient argument, and I think we we have a very good one. So for folk that are thinking about introducing this into their system, introducing this into their protocol, what do you say to them? It takes commitment. Right. And I would say that this is the only clinical intervention 
that EMS does that requires so many stakeholders to get accomplished. You have got to talk to your hospital. You have got to talk to your blood centers. If you have a regional advisory council, get them involved. Um, you know, if, if David buys a new defibrillator, he doesn't have to go to the hospital and ask permission and have cardiology oversee it. You just do it, right? Correct. But you can't do that with blood. It really, it's a team sport. You've got to get a lot of stakeholders involved. So, early. and finally, you've got a paper coming out. What is it and where can we read it? So the paper is called uh, Removing the Barriers to Pre-Hospital Transfusion, a map for ro roads, uh, sorry, a roadmap to success. And it will be in the Journal of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery where we outline the state of affairs um, in the US about pre-hospital blood and offer some solutions on how to get there. So an important topic, hopefully once it uh, comes out, I'm sure Dave will tip me off and we can get it published and where everybody can read it. Absolutely. So thank you both very much for this uh, very important discussion. As thank we you. say, back to you.